Hey, before you head in to the episode, I have a quick question for you. Would you be willing to leave the show a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts? And here's why I'm asking. The more that I learn about podcasting, growing your podcast, taking it to the next level, the more uh, the importance of ratings and review keep coming up. And I love this podcast so much. I love the guests that I've gotten to connect with and bring to you so far. I am excited about the guests that are on the calendar, that are in the queue, that are coming your way soon. I love hearing your feedback about what topics and guests resonate with you. I love getting your questions that factor into the type of guests that we bring on, to the the topics that we cover. And I want to do more of it. I want to do more of it. And by you sharing your rating and review over on Apple podcast that helps so much. So as a thank you for the first 10 people that leave a review and take a screenshot and then email it to Sarah, or I'm sorry, hello at sarahlinco.com. The first 10 people that do that, I'm going to send you back a $5 Starbucks gift card. I was thinking it's fall. Like who doesn't need a warm beverage at this point um, to sip on? And if you're not wherever you are in the world and it's not fall, who doesn't need a pep in their step every once in a while? So Starbucks gift card is coming your way when you leave a rating and review around Apple iTunes or Apple iPodcast. Got to get that right now and email it to me and I will make sure that you get your um, gift card back right away. So thank you so much. I appreciate it and uh, enjoy this episode. I can't believe these words would ever come out of my mouth, but this interview that I just did about processes has been one of my favorite conversations ever. And so if you just heard me say the word processes and your eyes also started to glaze over initially, stick with me for just a second. Um, cause I think I might change your mind. You might get to have your mind changed. Um, and if you love systems and structure and organization already, then you are absolutely going to fall in love with my guest today, who is Courtney Lazar. She runs an education agency called The Elevated Effect, which helps businesses create and implement systems so that they can A, scale, and we get into an interesting conversation around scaling versus business growth and the difference there, and then B, so that you as a business owner can reconnect with your passion, your why, where maybe before implementing some of these systems, you've been just kind of bogged down with the day-to-day tasks, the mundane, the things that don't necessarily light you up. So this is a way to kind of reignite that fire. And uh, I'm really excited for you to hear this one because not only will you leave inspired, but you're going to leave with several tangible takeaways that you can choose to implement as soon as getting done, as soon as you get done listening to this episode. Um, You'll also learn that Courtney is a type three with a wing four. So you've heard from Melinda in episode two as a type three wing two, Courtney identifies as a wing four. Um, and that shows up, um, in a couple different places. Our, our fours are kind of also called the, the artists. And so with her wing three or with her wing four, um, that's going to maybe influence a little bit more artistic ability, a little bit more style. And you will 100% see that energy in seconds of going to Courtney's website. And then also we get into a conversation around feelings and emotions. Even though our type threes are in that feeling center of intelligence, threes sometimes tend to be a little bit more repressed because they see emotions as getting in the way. So they will have them, but they will push them aside so that they can continue on to the goal. It's They see them as kind of just getting in the way and not being efficient. However, Courtney, as a wing four, has a little bit different of a take. So I'm excited for you to hear that part too. Um, If you resonate with a three and maybe don't identify with some of the things that you've heard about a three, you might resonate with her experience as a three too. Um, So that'll that'll be really fun to hear. So without further ado, here is Courtney talking about systems.
Welcome to another episode of the Enneagram MBA podcast. This is a show for aspiring and growing entrepreneurs and company leaders who are ready to get to know themselves, who are ready to get to know and really understand their clients and their teams, and who are ready to learn how to get known as they package and promote their expertise and services in a way that truly aligns with their personality, motives, and goals. So grab your notebook or open your notes app and I will see you in class. Okay, so today's interview is with Courtney Lazar and she is a business, an online business systems educator for coaches. And this is, this is probably, I'm going to try not to be selfish during this interview because I feel like Um, This is one of my, my weak points. (laughs) So, but I know that there's a lot of us who, when we think of systems, it's like glaze over. Um, So we're going to get into that, but we're also going to talk about Courtney's type, which is she has identified as a type three with a wing four. So first of all, Courtney, welcome to the podcast. And I want to hear right out the gate. How did you know you were a type three? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here and talk Um, all things Enneagram and systems, because like we were mentioning in our chat before, um, it's just so crazy how it like perfectly lined up with what I actually do in my job. So um, I'm really excited to have this conversation and like uh, the same reason you just said selfishly, I'm excited to learn more about the Enneagram side too, uh, because it's a little bit more foreign to me. Um, and the, the way to answer your question, how I found out was I just honestly saw everybody on, you know, social media and stuff, start talking about Enneagrams and, Um, I like to dive into personality types. Like for example, you know, in college, we took our strengths finders test. And then when I first started out in this space, I did my Myers Briggs. Um, and I was really kind of shocked at how well they, you know, kind of pinpointed my personality. Um, and I had even done like uh, the Myers Briggs test. We were driving to Savannah, Georgia one time, um, with my husband and I had him do it and we, his result was like dead on. I was like, man, this stuff does not, it's accurate. And so when Enneagram started to get popular, I was like, okay, now I have to see what type of an Enneagram I am. Uh, and so that's really how I went. I just was really honestly curious because I think it just, it's helpful to know because it, I think it gives you more insight to who you are as a person, but also just like your strengths, your weaknesses, and then ways to overcome those things based on your personality type. Yeah. You know, I've heard before, um, some other Enneagram teachers say that like the Enneagram sometimes is a little uncomfortable because it's not like strength finder where you're like, Oh, just like all of my strengths. <laughs> it's like the Enneagram will be very enlightening to a lot of the, sh- the shadow part of yourself, um, which yes. is, it can be really helpful. Um, now I know you said you identify most as a type three, which is known as the achiever or the, the role model. What about that type? was like, oh my gosh, yes, this is so me. Um, I'd say it probably just kind of relates. Look, so I, I was an athlete my entire life. Mm. Um, so I was a gymnast for nine years. I was in every sport in high school. Like I did not really know much life outside of sports. Um, and so I think from that aspect, it made total sense because I was super competitive, Um, I was a perfectionist when it came to even not just sports, but my schoolwork to, you know, wanting to make sure like I had really good grades and, you know, kind of went above and beyond from that aspect, which that's all good. But I will say that that does come with like, uh, I wouldn't miss, I mean, I guess it's not a negative, it's, it's a negative side. I mean, it can be a negative side. That's fine. You know, like the shadow side, the shadow is, you know, that you have really high expectations for yourself. And that makes it hard because you constantly feel like you're in go, go, go mode all the time. I don't ever feel like I can just like, let myself relax. Um, but I'd say that's where I really started to first, you know, kind of see the, that identifier, you know, showing up in my personal life. So, yeah. And it's really, it's interesting. And we all, we all have like all nine types. So a lot of us, even if you're not type three, you probably relate to some of what Courtney shared, but for threes, especially like their value tends to depend on 
what they do. So like they, you know, human doings versus human beings. And so it's like how valuable I am depends on how successful I am, which can be really exhausting. Does that resonate? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yes. I was actually just going to say, I just had this conversation yesterday because, um, you know, at the time of this recording, I'm almost nine months pregnant. And so I'll be going on my maternity leave and, you know, just kind of trying to figure out what life's going to look like for myself with balancing, you know, um, my, my son and work after that. Um, and, you know, I had a conversation with my husband because for so long, success for me looks like how I'm helping to contribute financially and with pausing, working to be a mom for a while. It's, it's, I'm kind of having an identity crisis a little bit because, um, I kind of feel like I'm contributing less, but at the same time, I'm being a mom, which is a huge job to have and super, super important. And I'm totally aware of that. And he's completely aware of that. It's just hard for me to make that mindset shift in my head, as far as what, what does success look like? How am I contributing in my personal life with my husband or with our family? Um, and it's making me feel a little uncomfortable because I feel like I need to be doing more, even though the role I'll be taking on is a massive, massive role. Like I'm raising another human. That's a pretty big deal. It's just like that mentality shift that I'm trying to st- try to accept at this point and like try to wrap my head around. That's been challenging for me too, that we've had to have conversations about because it's kind of stressing me out a little bit. Yes. And you know what, there, there is such a difference between like self-awareness, which is the first step, but it's like, just because you're aware of something you're right. Like, doesn't mean that it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I don't have that problem anymore. Like that isn't a thing because, um, for a lot of us who have these like unconscious childhood messages that turn into, you know, our core drivers in life, what we're running away from or running towards, um, it's hard to, yeah, it's hard to untie that. Like, I know that my success is not tied to my identity or my identity isn't like tied to my success, but still it's like, yeah, you, you struggle as you constantly have to like remind yourself. Um, and we all have those, we all have those things. It's like, yeah, who am I, if I'm not making money, like, what am, what am I doing here? Um, so the other thing about threes or one of the other things is because they are so focused on succeeding, they have this very intense fear of failure, which nobody wants to fail. Right. But for threes, it's really intense. So I just want to hear, um, and I said this before Courtney, but I'm going to say it again here while we're recording that, um, there's a lot of Enneagram theory out there. You can read a book, you know, I have 10 books on my desk about the Enneagram about type three, um, or whatever type it is, but it's like, we're human beings. And so like, I love these conversations that we're having to talk about like your personal experience experience as that. Um, so with that said, how is your relationship to failure? Like when I say that, like what comes up for you? Uh, yeah, it's, it's uncomfortable, right? Like it's not uncomfortable conversation to have it's failure is uncomfortable for me. Um, and again, this actually just came up yesterday. I think my husband and I were talking about something and he, Oh, his brother's getting married um, tomorrow and he lives in Europe. And so we're not able to attend. Obviously I can't fly right now. Um, and so we needed to make, we want to make a quick video for them so that they could watch it at their reception and, you know, give them our congratulations. And he was like, do you think you'll be able to get this video made by tomorrow? And I was like, look who you're talking to. I don't know how to fail, you know? Um, and that was literally a conversation we had last night because I it's, it's failure. It's a part of life. Right. And it's not that it's necessarily failing. It's just not maybe living up to the result that I had anticipated. Right. Um, you know, for example, like we talked about before we hopped on this episode, we're mid launch right now. So we're, uh, excuse me, we're relaunching our course and, you know, with that comes, you know, is it going to do well? Is it not going to do well? Um, and trying to not tie myself so much to the outcome is really hard, you know, for me to do, um, especially because of how I look at, you know, success versus failure in my head. Um, but that's again, something that I've struggled with my entire life. Like if, you know, I did less than perfect at a you know gymnastics competition, or if it was, um, you know, maybe not making the, uh, Dean's list in college or something like that. Those were all like 
really high expectations I had set for myself where failure really, it, if it rears its ugly head, it is not a, good, a comfortable thing for me to experience. Um, but I am getting more comfortable with being uncomfortable in that situation, um, or just being accepting that it's not failing. It's just a learning, um, you know, a learning time in my life. And that's really all that it is. And that's kind of, you know, I've talked about it in the past, um, you know, with starting my business when I first started my business and I left my nine to five, um, you know, two things were kind of at the forefront of that decision. One was, I wanted a certain type of lifestyle. I wanted to travel the world and, you know, live like a digital nomad and live independently. And that was what I wanted, you know, this was four years ago. Um, and so that's really what I wanted to do. And I was also just terrified of failing by like, I was scared to tell people that I was quitting my job to work for myself because I didn't want to fail and then have to turn around and admit that it didn't work out. Um, you know, thankfully that hasn't happened. Um, but when I talk about, you know, what is success, we talk about that a lot with my students, honestly, like identifying what success looks like for us. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that it's good to understand that it can evolve with your life. And that's, what's great about running your own business is it can also evolve with your life. And so for example, now I'm married and we just bought our first house and we're having our first baby in a couple of weeks. And so my lifestyle looks completely different now than it did when I first started my business four years ago. And so, you know, and I did do like the traveling stuff for a little bit and, you know, worked for myself independently, did the digital nomad stuff. And so, you know, for a little bit, I was like, did I fail? Did I not do what I, you know, said I was going to go out to do, but it wasn't that I failed is like, I accomplished it, but my, my life evolved and that transition was, a you know, it wasn't a failure. It was just my, my life evolving. So very long winded answer to your question, but (laughs) No, that was perfect. That's perfect. I want you to be the one doing most of the talking. So that was perfect. You know, um, fail that fear of failure is very real for, for all of us. And I know that that has to be like, if not the number one, one of the top reasons why people don't pursue something new. Um, and I will get to the, your, your jump story, maybe in just a minute, leaving that nine to five and starting your own. Um, but what, is there any other advice or any other lessons that you would have to share with somebody else, um, who's thinking about taking that leap, or maybe they're thinking about pivoting. I just interviewed, um, somebody a couple of weeks ago about doing something. They used to be a copywriter and now they're creating, this is episode two with Melinda Martin, by the way. Um, now they're starting this whole kind of new lifestyle brand for parents, um, with kids. And that was scary because she got known for something. So there's all kinds of leaps and fears of failure, but what advice would you have for anybody who's kind of stuck on the ledge because they're, they have that fear of failure? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think, you know, I think there's a couple of things to think about and what I think my big driver was, is I never wanted to become complacent in my life. If that makes sense. I just, I didn't want my life to sit stagnant just because I was scared because for me, just sitting in a situation that just didn't feel very fulfilling, or maybe didn't totally feel aligned with the direction I wanted my life to head. That feels worse to me than I think failing does. Um, Mm -hmm. and so I think for me, that was a big thing where I was like, you know, at least I tried, um, at least I took the leap and like took a bet on myself because if I didn't, then I would just still be sitting where I was at. Um, that's a conversation that I have with my, my little sister quite often. Um, just because, you know, she's not exactly happy in her, you know, current job. And she's really, that's one thing she's really struggled with is, you know, taking that leap to try something different because it's scary. Right. Um, and because of the, potential that it may not work out or something like that. And so I think that's like my, my big driver is I just complacency is not something I'm more uncomfortable with complacency than I am with Mm -hmm. feeling. Um, and I think that's probably part of the achiever side of my personality is I don't want my life to just sit. Um, and that's not to say that, um, you know, it's not okay to just be content with your life. Right. I think that there's a difference between the two, but between being complacent and being content, Um, because I think that's another thing, you know, as an achiever, that is hard for me is like, 
when I accomplish something, instead of like just sitting in that accomplishment and like being proud of it or celebrating it, I'm on to the next thing. I'm not, I don't really think about like, holy crap, look at all that you've accomplished. It's, I am more concerned about what am I going to do next? Like, what's the next big thing I need to do? Um, and so from the fear perspective, I think really for me, it was just kind of, you know, sitting down and being okay with failing if it happened, because I would rather try and fail than not try at all. And then just wonder for the rest of my life, what if I had done this differently? Um, and so that's, that was the big reason. And my, the reason I left was because I'm like, if I don't do this now, you know, I may never do it. And then I'm just always going to wonder. And so that was what kind of pushed me over to do yes. that. Yes. So. Yes. And you know, for, for me, cause I've, I've made a similar leap and there were, there were lots of reasons that ended up pushing me over the edge, but one of them was I had a good friend that I had worked at Starbucks with when I lived in Chicago and he was actually my manager at the time. And he was like on the fast track to like, you know, Starbucks, um, executive <laughs> and, um, he ended up leaving and starting his own gym and he opened another gym and then he opened another gym and then he opened like a brand and we stayed in touch. And, um, it was like five years later. I mean, we had stayed in touch the whole time, but for whatever reason, it hit me that I was like kind of doing the same thing. I wasn't still at Starbucks, but I was still, um, you know, living this life that I, I was just like waiting for something to take off. And here he was, had like jumped and made a really risky decision, leaving safety and security and this great job. And that was kind of the thing for me, just, you know, reiterating what you said was like, I was like, wow, like, look how much he has accomplished. And like, I'm still standing here thinking and trying to figure out the best thing for me to do when I will never know that <laughs> until I, I just, jump. So I feel that too, when it's, when it's like, yeah, nobody wants to fail, but also you don't also want to like wake up 10 years from now and still be in the same spot. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. I totally agree. And I think that's, that's a lot of the feedback that I got from like my friends and just acquaintances is like, after I'd quit my job and it, you know, my business hadn't failed. And because my business hadn't failed, I was able to you know, live my life very differently than, um, you know, a lot of my peers were, you know, like I mentioned, I did the travel thing for a while. So I went back, back to Europe and I, you know, I got to live a lifestyle that I decided for myself. And I, that's a lot of, you know, I'd have people message me on Facebook or Instagram and saying like, how are you doing this? And I'm like, it's, I just decided to, like, it was just, uh, like you said, you took a jump and that was just, I just decided. And it was nothing more than that. Right. I had never run a business before. I had zero clue what I was doing. Like there's probably millions of people out there that are way more qualified to do, you know, or to, to start a business than I, I mean, I was 23, 24 at the time and definitely not, you know, I wasn't exactly a seasoned, you know, I, I, I mean, I'd had jobs my entire life, but I hadn't, run a business. So, um, I'd say that's, you know, it's just doing it. And I was just trying to figure out, figure it out along the way, which for myself, you know, being that achiever type a, you know, I like a plan and I like yeah. to have a plan and I didn't really have one. And so that whole season of my life was, it was uncomfortable, but it's been, you know, obviously very worth it at this point. Mm -hmm. Yes, it has. Um, I, I want to go back to something that you said, you said, um, you're just kind of always thinking what's next. Like you get to the goal and then you're what's next. And that is very typical of a type three who's in the assertive group with the sevens and the eights. They have this future focused energy, kind of yeah. what's next, um, looking to go far and fast into the future. Mm -hmm. um, the other group that threes are in or another group um, is when it, it comes to how they handle conflict. Mm -hmm. And the textbooks say that threes are in this group with our, with our ones and our fives, where when something happens, um, they, they're putting emotions aside and thinking, show me the data. Don't give me the drama. And for three specifically, they're thinking there's gotta be an efficient solution to this. Let's just sit down and get to work. Yeah. Um, 
what does that feel true for you? And if so, what oh, yeah. parts? Very, very true. Um, especially when it comes to like my personal life, right? Like my relationship with my husband, as an example, um, I'm a very much about finding solutions. And so if something were to come up in our personal life, like we disagreed about something or, you know, we had to have a more than, you know, maybe not a pleasant conversation about something. I, am, I, I hate walking away from the conversation without a solution, right? I'm like, okay, this is the issue. What are we going to do to fix it, you know, moving forward, you know, and he's completely opposite of me. He is let's sweep it under the rug. It's fine. You know, which that works for him. It does not work for me. And, and we've really had to, uh, you know, try to navigate our personalities and, and how we resolve conflict in our personal life, because we are so different about it. And he has kind of gotten to the point that he knows like, okay, before we walk away from a conversation, she needs like a closing statement, if that makes sense. And it's not necessarily every time a solution because there's not, you know, always a solution to something, but he knows that I am always like, okay, well, are we going to discuss this later? Like what's going to happen, which you know, I'm also aware that that's not always the best thing, right? Sometimes there's just not a solution. And sometimes you just need to kind of sit with what your, you know, what the issue is or, you know, something like that. It doesn't always have to have a resolution. Uh, and you know, and I always, when I was, I would read about stuff, you know, don't go to bed angry and things like that. But sometimes you just need to like walk away from a conversation and let yourself like decompress a little bit. And so I think that's kind of, you know, what we talked about previously, like recognizing our strengths, but also recognizing when it's potentially a weakness or, you know, a shadow part of our personality. And I am completely aware that that's probably not helping our conflict resolution all the time. And sometimes it is okay to just walk away. There's not a solution. Let's calm down, you know, whatever that looks like, but I'm very much like, let's approach it head on. Like, what are we going to do to solve this problem? How are we going to make sure it doesn't happen again? Right. Like that's 100% my personality. Um, and so that's definitely, a definitely been something that I've had to work through myself too, um, in my personal life. So Yes. Yeah. That efficiency is kicking in. Like how can there, it's gotta be an efficient solution. Let's just, yeah, get to it. Um, the, so another thing that's kind of tied into this, and I would just love to hear your personal experience with this. So, um, threes are in the heart center of intelligence, meaning those types in that center, like feel first and they're, they can be really in touch with their emotions, twos, threes, fours, except for threes, they're actually repressed a little bit in that, in that section, um, or in that area, because they're so focused on efficiency. They see emotions as being unproductive and just getting in way of the goal. So I know that you run a team. I know that, you know, you've talked about the relationship with your husband. I know that you're, you know, I'm sure have family and friends and students. How do you handle maybe your own emotions when those come up? Do you allow yourself to feel them? How does that work? And then how do you handle others' emotions when they, when they come up? Yeah. So I think that's probably a, uh, an outlier for me when it comes to my personality type, because, and my husband would agree with me on this. I am a more than, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm emotional. I I'm can be emotional. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, I, I'm a, I'm a feeler. So like, I'll just give you a very embarrassing example. Um, I cannot kill a bug in my house, right? Like I cannot do it at all because I cannot stop thinking about what that bug might be thinking. Right? Like, this is a very embarrassing, this is just kind of an example. Right. And so even if, you know, I remember one time I was taking a shower and there was a wasp in the bathroom Um, and I like, you know, wrapped myself up in a towel and I ran into the kitchen and I got a jar of pickles out of the kitchen or out of the refrigerator. And I dumped it out just to go catch this wasp and go put it outside. And so I think that's my one outlier to be very honest about my personality, because I am very emotional or I'm always trying to think about like what somebody else is thinking, um, because I don't want to hurt someone's feelings or I don't want to, play into a part of, you know, contributing to a negative emotion for them. Um, and so I think that, um, is probably maybe a little bit different from my personality type, but as far as team and like work goes and how I kind of navigate it that way, um, number one, when it comes to actually running the business, 
we, or like the decision-making processes in the business there for a while, it was really, really hard for me to make decisions because I'm kind of a people pleaser, um, where I was at one point when I first started my business, I want people to be happy with the work I'm producing. I want them to be happy to work with me. And if they're not, I want to fix it. Like how, how can I make your life easier? Right. But what happened is that led to burnout because I was constantly trying to take care of everybody else versus my own business. Um, Um, and at the same time, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think burnout's probably the biggest thing that, you know, reared its ugly head because of being a people pleaser. And so I had to get comfortable with saying no and like turning down opportunities and work and things like that. And again, I think that has something to do, um, with the achiever side, you know, always wanting to achieve or, um, you know, I guess people pleasing probably leans into that a little bit. Um, but, but yeah, I think that's, that's probably, um, a big piece of it, but with the, with my team and this kind of plays into the emotion part is I always want to, I I always check in with my team. Like I'm always Mm -hmm. messaging them privately. I'm saying, how are you feeling? Is there anything I can do to support you? Um, are you feeling overwhelmed? How can we avoid that? Like, you know, I don't want my team to ever feel like I'm not there to help take care of them. Um, and so Mm -hmm. I think, I, yeah, I don't know if that goes with a three to be very honest. Um, it kind of doesn't feel like it does, but maybe it does. And I just don't know, but that's kind of how I navigate that, um, with my team and with my business. So it, it totally goes. And even if it doesn't like that would be perfectly fine too. Um, but so three superpower is this ability to like read a room Mm -hmm. and be able to, so they have that, like those empathetic vibes. Um, and they're able to kind of like adjust accordingly to be whoever they need to be in order to, um, you know, take care of that person or to, to blend in if needed, which is a superpower. And then it can also, you can lose yourself at Mm -hmm. times too with that. Um, but that, that sounds, um, very on point with that. Does you you have empathy, you have empathy for a wasp, but like, yeah. And, (laughs) but, (laughs) and also, um, and this will kind of lead us into the work that you do, but, um, I know that you mentioned, you also identify as a wing four, which are the feelers on the Enneagram. They they feel the most. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. So you got some, you got some four feelings in you. Um, and fours, I'll just, I'll say this. I don't want to hear, I want to hear what resonates with anything from this, but um, type three wing four are called the professional mm-hmm. and, um, they're really good at the, uh, we mentioned this before. I mentioned this before. They can almost resemble a one. Mm-hmm. They're a little less outgoing according to the textbook than maybe the, the three wing two, mm-hmm. um, and a really task oriented. So that's where those maybe one vibes comes in. Yeah. And I know that like your whole business is built on systems. <laughs> <laughs> so- yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, okay, yeah, maybe this is like, so, so Courtney right now. Yeah. Um, what, yeah. What about that resonates? Yeah. So, um, my, yeah, my whole business is literally systems processes, planning, like that's what my business revolves around. And it wasn't, um, it, I kind of fell into it because when I first started working for myself, um, and I was trying to think through, okay, I want to start my own business. Uh, I, at first I was like, I'm going to be a web designer because that seems like probably the, the best way I could make a decent living in the remote space. And then I started taking on my first web design clients. And I'm like, I hate this. I'm not creative. You know, this is totally uncomfortable for me. Um, you know, like I could look at another website and like duplicate it, but I could not come up with a design in my own head. Right. I just, if somebody came to me and said, oh, you know, I kind of want it to look like this. I'm like, okay, well, good luck with that because I can't come up with that. It just was not, a, you know, with my personality type. And so I did that mind, I kind of like some mind mapping and started like listening. Okay. What am I good at? What did I, you know, of my past jobs that I enjoy doing, you know, I loved organizing, I love planning and, and how can I monetize that in an online space? And so I found this term kind of being thrown around called an OBM. Um, and those, for those who don't know, that's an online business manager. And they basically, basically kind of come in as 
you know, like the right hand in your business, like an operations manager, they help you manage your team, your business, et cetera. And so I did that for about three years. And then I pivoted my business, um, about a year and a half ago to solely focus on systems because that's what, when I was, you know, being an OBM, I was noticing the part that I loved the most. Like when I would come into somebody's business, you know, I kind of like to compare it to like an HGTV episode of like, when you flip a house, the dirtier the house, you know, the, the cooler, the flip. Right. <laughs> and so that was how it felt for me. Like the messier, the back end of their business was the more I loved it because I got to see that before and after. Right. And it was very satisfying for me to be able to go in and say, okay, here's all our holes. Here's what, why these things are happening and here's where we can make it better. And then I got to make it better. And that's what lit me up. Right. I'm like that part of my job was what was my absolute favorite. And so I was like, okay, why don't I just find a way to do this every single day? And so that's what I did. And that's how I pivoted my business. We, you know, solely focused on doing like full set of system setups for my clients or just doing click up setups. Um, click up, if you're unaware is a project management tool, like kind of similar to like Asana, um, or Trello Basecamp, um, monday.co, if you've heard of any of those. Um, but it's in my opinion, by far the best. And so that's what we ended up switching to. And so that's literally my job now it's, it's systems, it's teaching systems to other people in their business. Because like you mentioned at the beginning of the episode, you know, whenever you bring up systems, your eyes kind of glaze over. And that's very true for a lot of people. Like I don't, you know, I like to kind of say, you know, systems is not the sexy stuff of business, right? It's not, it's kind of like legal. Nobody really wants to do it, but it's so important if you want to have a scalable business in order to kind of surpass what you currently have as far as like a plateau or income ceiling you may be hitting because you're either, you know, like a solopreneur or you have a team, but there's no systems. And so the team's kind of flailing around and we can't scale past our current capacity. And so, yeah, so that's really kind of how I got to where I was and obviously makes very much I mean, it makes sense for my personality. So I'm um, just kind of, I mean, paying attention to what I liked and, and making, you know, the decision to pivot and do more of what I liked versus staying in what I didn't like, so to speak. Well, I love your, and I don't even know that you meant to do this, but it's almost like your process for figuring out like, how can I start my own business? And it's like, what am I good at? Mm-hmm. What do I like? And then how can I monetize that? Mm-hmm. And what I, I think um, is one of the biggest takeaways from this is just that like you didn't start out doing what you're doing. It's like you did a graphic design mm-hmm. or website design. You, you did the OBM and then here you are. So it's not, I think sometimes there's like this pressure to be like, oh my God, what am I going to do for the rest of my life once yeah. I make this jump? And it's just like the next step. It's just like the next right turn, not like the business for the rest of your life. Um, okay. So what, okay. So yeah, I, I mean, I have to be honest, um, systems, especially being a type seven where I'm like, Oh, I hate, you know, structure, Mm -hmm. (laughs) geez, boring, such a snooze alert. Um, but yes, they are so important. Mm -hmm. Um, I just kind of want to start with this question around, you mentioned scaling. And then I know you've also talked about growth, business growth, and that seems really sexy and fun, but like scaling, what's the difference? Yeah. So, I mean, they can kind of go hand in hand, right? Your ability, I mean, your business can grow, right? Your business can grow. Um, and you know, growth could look, you know, monetary, it could look, um, you know, like, okay, I hired a team member or we took on more clients, right? That that to me would be growth. Scalability, in my opinion, is your ability to be able to successfully scale past your current um, ceiling in your business, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Because we can um, can hire a team, right? We can hire a team, we can bring on more clients. Um, But I think the difference is really kind of looking at what does the back end of my business look and feel like, right? So for me, yes. Okay. I'll just kind of give an example. Um, when I was an OBM, I grew my business, right? There's that growth word. I grew my business. I had 14 clients. I had me and one other person on my team that I, I mean, she didn't really help with client work. She helped with more like back end stuff. 
And so that was not scalable because my business relied on me being available and present to grow. And so I was not able to successfully scale my business past where I was because I built my business around me and that was not scalable. And I didn't have enough systems in place to successfully take on new clients um, because I hadn't, you know, I hadn't taken the time to really think through what does a successful system look like in my business. And so I think that's kind of the difference between the two, between like, Hey, my business can grow, but it can only grow to a certain point. And there's a difference between being a scalable business model and just a business that's doing well, but kind of, kind of flailing in the back end. Does that make sense? It, it does. Yes. And I had never thought about it. And I, I saw something you had shared on Instagram around that. And I was like, gosh, that's such a good distinction. And something I'm really into right now is because I work a lot of my client students are also coaches. Um, and so, um, which people get into to, to help people mainly right. to follow a passion. And, um, sometimes we lose, or maybe we never even think about being a CEO. And so we have a coach hat on at all times and never step into a CEO. And so I think that just like what you're doing and just what you described then is just like one way to put that CEO hat on and still help people yeah. and coach. Okay. And this is kind of a leading question, but um, I'm assuming that one of the benefits of scaling is to, to have more time to do the thing you do want to do. What, what other benefit, like what would be the, the, the motivation behind somebody taking the time to get these things set up? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, I think for myself and for a lot of our clients is getting time back. Right. I think that's the biggest thing because we start our business and we don't really, I mean, I didn't anticipate it to you know, grow or become as successful as it did as quickly as it did. You know, I think that happens, you know, thankfully to quite a few of us, you know, we unexpectedly are successful. Um, and what comes with that is, okay, I started my business because I'm passionate about something. So for example, if you're a coach, you're passionate about helping people or in some, you know, some capacity and that's great. But then when your business becomes successful, there's a lot more backend work that comes with that, right? You don't just get to coach anymore. You have an entire business going on in the back end. Um, and for, I, I would say like for coaches specifically, um, you know, or just kind of more the creatives, um, um, visionary types, uh, you know, that's only going to be sustainable for a certain amount of time. And we're going to get to this point where like, crap, I only have enough room to take on one one more, you know, one-on-one -on -one client, or I really want to start a group coaching program, but I've got all these one-on-one -on -one clients. I can't be present on calls all week long, every single day. Like, how do I make this scalable? And so I think it's kind of recognizing, okay, what do I want my business to look like? And what do I need to have built in the back end to support doing that? Um, so that I can, you know, successfully, um, have more revenue coming into my business, be able to step away from my business and take a vacation. Um, you know, so for example, if you are a coach, maybe it's doing something like you're implementing systems, but you're also hiring co-coaches, right? Maybe you're hiring co-coaches to come in and help support your, um, your packages and your services. And I think that's another thing too, to kind of look at from a systems perspective is evaluating your offers, right? I think that's another big thing is, are my offers supporting the long-term lifestyle that I want for myself? Um, when I first started my business, you know, there's all this talk about your mission statement and your vision statement and all these things. And I was like, I don't need to write that down. That's fluff, right? I, I'm a very you know, type A, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I, give me, give me the tasks, right? I don't want to write a vision statement, but the problem that came with that down the line is I started saying yes to everything and every opportunity that came my way. And what happened is my business was kind of just going in a circle. It wasn't really going anywhere because I didn't know where I wanted it to go. And so when I finally, I read this book called the vision driven leader by Michael Hyatt, and he very um, easily 
and tangible steps explained, this is how you create a vision, vision. This is why it's important for your business. And these are the steps to make sure it's being integrated in your business on a, on a daily basis. Right. And it clicked for me that way. Right. It, it, it removed the fluff and it talked about like the, like you kind of talked about the data, like what's the, the hard hitting stuff that I need to know and why it's important. And so when I'm making decisions in my business now, I kind of like think of it as like a Cosmo magazine quiz, if that makes sense. You know, so if there's a, an opportunity that presents itself and I ask myself, does this get me closer to what I want for my life? Yes or no, or for my business. And if it doesn't, then I decline the, uh, the opportunity or what the client, whatever it is. And if it does, I say yes. And so that was another way for me to kind of also remove the emotion from decision-making in my business, because it helped me to decide, okay, is this actually leading me closer to my end goal? And if it didn't, then it made it easier for me to be comfortable saying no, if that makes sense. And so from the packages and services perspective, like are those serving your long-term goal? If it's, you know, I want to be able to only work, you know, 25 hours a week or whatever that looks like, making sure that the decisions we're making and the systems we're implementing to support that, support that long-term goal. Does that make sense? It does. And that's so good. And um, that's going to be really helpful for those of us who do have that shiny object syndrome more so than maybe other people. And um, this is just making me think of something, Courtney, I'm laughing because I, I've, I've had to ask myself like some version of that question in the past, because there's times where I'm like, you know what, I think I want to be a cycle bar instructor, um, a spin instructor. And then I'm like, you know, I might like do some interior design. I don't know. That sounds fun. But then it's like, yeah, having that goal it's like the goal was like, can you do 10 things at once? I was like, well then yeah, like all that makes sense, but that's not what I, what I want. Like there is that yes. goal. And so I, I love that you said that. And I just looked at that book and I'm like, I probably need to get that book. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let me ask you this and like everything that you just shared in there was like, so, so valuable. I was like taking notes for myself, um, even like evaluating your offers. And that's sometimes really hard, even just to yeah. like, when you first start out, um, well, yeah, what's my offer. But again, when you have that value, like you were saying, or like your, your vision rather, it's like, okay, then I can create some offers that, that align with that. Um, Okay. So let me ask you this vision or not vision um, systems is a term that like I hear about a lot. And it, I like, I, like we talked about, like for me, my eyes tend to glaze over and I'm yeah. like, yeah, systems. And like, yeah, there's like Asana. Okay. And like, they're just like so intangible. Mm -hmm. And for anybody else who might feel that way, can you just give an example of like a system or like maybe like a great system to focus on for somebody who's like just getting started with the thought of like getting systems and scaling in place. Yeah. Yeah. That's so that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked it because I feel like there is a big misconception or misunderstanding about what systems are. Right. Because I think when somebody says, Oh, I want to put implement systems in my business. I think nine times out of 10 people associate that with technology, right? Like a yes. software or a platform, yes. like, Oh, if I'm going to implement systems, that means I'm creating an Asana account and I'm using Asana, but, <laughs> you know, but systems aren't just platforms, right? It's, um, it's processes, it's people systems. It's things that we're actually doing day to day in our business. Um, that's a system, right? And so an example that I could give of that is okay. Let's, I typically like to break it down. We actually just did a training on this last week. Um, there's five operational systems or in it's, it's a, it's operations, right? It's the operational things that you do day to day in your business that keep your business moving, right? You have client management systems. So those are things like client onboarding, client offboarding, um, you have sales systems. So how are, and like, what's my lead generation process look like? How do I manage leads when they approach me? Um, what are my sales processes after I have a conversation with a lead? Um, what are communication systems even? So how do I communicate internally with my team or externally with my clients? And what does that process look like? Um, and, and so I think those are some 
you know, good places to start in terms of, okay, if you're kind of evaluating or auditing your business, um, what I always recommend my clients doing when I first start with them, and this is good for anyone to start with is evaluating the recurring tasks that you're doing in your business. I think that is square one for everybody because it's, I mean, that's where we're going to really start to focus in. Okay. What am I currently doing and what should I not be doing anymore in my business? So for example, if you were to just get out a piece of paper and write these columns, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, you know, whatever cadence you kind of want to write it down and list out all of those tasks underneath those columns. So what do you do every single day? And it can be as you know mundane as I check my email every day. I check in on Slack with my clients every day. You want to write down every little thing that you do in your business every day, week, month, year, et cetera. And then what you want to do is you want to evaluate those tasks. And there's a couple of ways that you can do that. So it's kind of, you can do, um, um, I guess it's not like a mental check-in, but just how you're feeling about like the task itself and then a data check-in, right. And like, how is this producing a return on my time in my business? So you want to go through those tasks and you want to mark them. Hey, what do I want to keep? What I want to keep doing on me. Like I enjoy doing this task. What do I want to eventually delegate or currently delegate? If you have a team to a team member, what do I want to automate in my business if possible? And what do I want to delete? Right. What do I no longer want to do anymore? And I think that's the piece people skip a lot um, because I think we're in a space of constant connectedness. Um, you know, we're always seeing what everybody else is doing in their business. It's okay. This person has a blog and this person has a podcast and they're on Facebook and TikTok and Instagram and all these things. And so you see them being successful while doing all the things, but are those things actually going to serve your business? Right. And how do I make that decision? And so I'll kind of give you an example and this is where, you know, data kind of comes into play. Right. But it's super important. So let's say for example, you go and you engage on Facebook every single day for three hours and you get one lead that comes to your website from that or books a call with you. And then you go to Instagram and you spend one hour on Instagram engaging and you get 10 leads. Well, obviously your time is much more well spent engaging on Instagram versus engaging on Facebook. And so that's a way to kind of logistically look at it and see, okay, this is my time on Facebook is not producing anything in my business, really. Like it's not helping push the needle forward in my business. I need to stop doing this task. It is not serving me anymore and only focus on the things that are actually serving your business. And so when you're going through and evaluating that task list, those are some of the questions that you can ask yourself. And I think it kind of ties back to, again, complacency. We're just doing it because we think think we're supposed to do it or because we've always done it versus, okay, stopping and evaluating. Why am I doing this task? Is it serving my business and basically going through and auditing your task list that way? And that's a really good place to start when it looks at, when you're looking at kind of systemizing and leaning out um, the efficiency piece in your business. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, that's so good. Okay. Let me ask you this. I got two more questions. Um, So kind of piggybacking off this question. Um, one of the things that I typically work with my clients on is content creation Uh and, um, or I used to do more of that and, um, you know, people spend, I know forever creating graphics and creating content and writing captions and trying to repurpose and just kind of what you were saying. And you shared something on one of your Instagram posts about like, these five things that people think that they need and really what they need is to focus on systems. Mm -hmm. So for somebody who's maybe just starting out kind of getting going, like what, what are some content tips? And I guess you just shared one around, you know, look at where you're, you're getting your leads from, Mm -hmm. um, anything else around like content creation? Cause that just seems to be like such a thing around like visibility and, Mm -hmm. and any tips for like systemizing it or just thinking at it thinking about it from like a CEO perspective than just like a a coach who has to create content. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a a big one that a lot of people get tripped up on is content. Um, you know, a lot of it, I think a lot of people get stuck in, Oh crap, I need to write content for next week. Or I don't even need, I don't even know what I should write next week. And I think the big piece to content is 
failing to plan. I think that's the big, you know, mistake that people make. And it's not necessarily failing to plan to write content. It's failing to plan the direction your business is heading in the next year as an example. Um, and so like what we typically would do is, okay, we look at, you know, what are we launching? What do we have upcoming? What do I want to be focusing on in my content? And we do that, you know, typically on a quarterly basis, just because, you know, you can, I would say, plan out your year as well as you can, but things change in running a business so quickly that planning out details past 90 days really isn't going to be a good use of your time. And so I typically say on a quarterly basis, okay, let's look at the next three months. What do we have upcoming? What do we want to launch? What packages or services do we want to promote or what types of content do we want to teach on? And I would reverse engineer it from there, right? I would break that down. And I would say, okay, how do I want to introduce this content this month? And it, maybe it's something you have like content themes or buckets, right? Like pillars mm-hmm. that you focus on. Um, and I would build that out. I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of batching content as much as possible. Um, and so we typically batch our content on a monthly basis. So it's, we identify what we want to focus on. We draft the content and we create the graphics. I review and approve it. I will go ahead and say I outsource my content, most of it, because this is it's the creative side. That stuff that does not come naturally to me. And I am a very aware of that. Um, and I know that's not a good use of my time because what would take, you know, somebody else 30 minutes to write an email would take me probably two hours. Right. And that's not a good you know, use of my time. And so that is something that we have systemized a process in the back end um, to batch out our content based on what we have upcoming in our business. So it's kind of a hard question to answer because I think it depends on your business a little bit in terms of how you launch, if you do launch, or if your, your business is more of an evergreen business where you just have products and services available all the time. So I think that's going to depend a little bit on how your business structure is. Um, but that's, that's how we typically work a little on the back end as far as content goes for our business. So. Well, and I think that it's just, it's just picking out what you said, I think was, it's like that going back to that vision piece mm-hmm. is like how important that is. So you can align everything else. Yeah. Um, okay. Last question before I get into like my, my rapid fire questions. Um, what, when should somebody start thinking about systems? Like, is it a certain revenue? Yeah. Tell, tell so that's a, that. that's a good question um, too. And it's really anytime, right? So okay. when we have clients come to us, we have typically two different types of clients. Number one, it is somebody that started their business. It scaled really quickly and they didn't have systems in place. And so they've hit this plateau, right? Like I can't take on more clients. I need to hire, but I don't have systems in place. Um, and they're stuck in this hamster wheel because they have so many clients and they don't have time to take a step back and implement the systems that they need to move forward. Um, and so that's typically where we'll have a client come to us and be like, help, you know, I've set up my systems for me because I don't have time. Um, and so that's, client number A or client A. (laughs) Um, And then client B would be, you know, somebody that maybe they're just getting started and they recognize like systems are not my jam. Like I cannot do this. Uh, They do not make sense for me. It doesn't click. I know I need help. Um, now if I were to say the best, you know, scenario for when to implement systems, it's immediately when you start your business, like, because that's, what's going to make it easier for you to scale and grow nine times out of 10. Most of us don't do that. I didn't do that. You know, I tried, but I didn't know what my business was going to look like to build systems around to support it. And so I think that's why, you know, the recurring tasks is a really good place to start because it's just evaluating what you are currently doing versus, what should I be doing or what should I be doing to support what business is going to look like? Because when I first started my business, I didn't know what I wanted it to look like. I had no idea, you know, there was all this, you know, you need need to have an annual plan and a three-year plan. I'm like, I can't even see past the next month. Like I can't, I don't know how I'm supposed to build systems around, you know, the next year or three years. Um, and so that's why I'd say like starting with those task lists for the beginners is good. But as far as when to implement systems, implementing them in some form or fashion in your business now is always going to be the best solution because, you know, for example, I was just having a conversation yesterday um, with somebody, she is wanting to pivot to more of an agency in her business. And she knows that that's going to happen in January and that she's going to have to hire. 
okay, well, what does that look like? We need to make sure we have um, trainings and SOPs prepared for when we want to hire. We need to have an onboarding process. We need to know what their role is going to look like. And those are all things that are best planned in advance, right? And then she messaged me this morning and said, I just found out that my team member is leaving this like in the next 30 days. And so her timeline drastically, you know, shrunk down. Um, and then, you know, that's, that's just a good example of like, you know, if we would have had this stuff built out, this wouldn't have been an issue, right? We would have been able to effectively, Hey, no problem. Good luck. They go on their merry way. And we onboard somebody else because, there's already an onboarding system and a training system in place to successfully onboard a team member. So does that kind of make sense? Yes. That's so good. So pro, so CEO. <laughs> um, what, what do you have going on now before we get to the last rapid questions? Like, I know that you're in the middle of your launch right now. When do your yeah. doors close? What's next after that for anyone who's wanting to learn more? And then where are you hanging out on on social media? Yeah. So great question. So yeah, we just opened doors to, um, we've had our course actually for a while. It was called the elevated system. Um, and it was a systems A to Z course, basically. Um, we pivoted it and we completely revamped it. And now it's solely focused on systems for coaches. Um, and so that's really what we have going on right now. We have a cart close. It's next Tuesday, but we will probably be, uh, relaunching that pretty soon too. Um, again, uh, and maybe potentially turning it evergreen and being just available all the time. Um, but that is what we currently have as our big offer. We also do offer a click up setups. So if click ups foreign territory and you just don't want to mess with it, um, that is our big, uh, primary service that we offer outside of our course. Um, as far as getting in touch at the elevate effect on Instagram, and that's my website as well. Um, and that's, yeah, I'm happy to, if you guys have questions about systems, I'm more than happy to chat with you guys in the DMs. It's like I say, like my love language. So I love to chat about it anytime. So, yeah. And well, I'll have to get with you too, Courtney. I'm assuming you have an affiliate link for ClickUp yes, for anybody yes. who's okay. So we'll yes, add that to the show notes. Cause that was new to me until I had found out about you on Instagram and yeah. I didn't even know that existed. So for people yep. who are, we'll include that one. Um, okay. What's something that you're learning right now? Ooh, oh, that's a good question. Um, something I'm learning right now, I would say is to slow down. I think that's a big one. We had a very, very busy year. Um, we, you know, are expecting our first baby. We got married in May. We bought our first house in February. We're renovating the house while also simultaneously planning for the baby to get here. And I have my business I'm running, which is a complete, you know, project itself and we're launching. Um, and we're also launching a podcast at the you know end of the month. And so we have had a million and one things going on. And I, I'm really trying to go into more of a season of learning to slow down a little bit and just be present versus going, going, going all the time. Um, and so I think that's, that's a really big one that I'm trying to focus on right now. <laughs> Such a good one. What's something that you're unlearning? Um, I'd say it kind of ties into that too, is like having a million things on our plate. I think that's both for myself and my husband, we're both achievers, right? We both want to like do, do, do all the time. Um, we're bad at relaxing. Um, and so I think we're kind of trying to unlearn having to have so much stuff on our plate all the time to feel like we're accomplishing something, if that makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people can relate to that one. Yeah. Now, I know you mentioned the Michael Hyatt book, The Vision Driven yeah. Leader. Any other book recommendation around personal growth, business, maybe efficiency that you yeah. would um, share with our readers or our listeners? Yes. Uh, Traction by far is my absolute favorite, favorite business book. Um, and okay. I think it's by Gina Wickman, I think. Um, I'm I think you're right. Yeah. I can't, I'm ashamed I've of myself. Of I can't one. even think of the author's name, but Traction is by far my favorite business book. Okay. Okay. And then what's the podcast going to be called? Um, it's just going to be called, um, elevate. So it is, okay. um, it's, it's, it's really pretty simple. Um, but we are going to be focusing every episode in some way towards systems. Even when we're in we have our guests, we're going to, you know, try to interview them from the perspective of how systems have implemented, um, been implemented in their business or impacted their business. Um, so for example, we had a guest expert yesterday. She's a graphic designer, right? She's a creative, um, and you know, systems are not really her jam, but they are 
a huge piece as to why her business is successful. Um, and so we're always going to try to have, um, you know, some type of system type of episode, uh, you know, something systems oriented in an episode and we're not fluffy people, right? We don't really believe in fluff. And so I wanted it to be a podcast where people could listen and take away something from it to go implement in their business. And so every episode is going to have some type of action steps that somebody can take to walk away with. So where it's uh, going to be launching August 25th. So, okay. Well, yeah. well, I hope that people can, yeah, connect with you on Instagram, keep an eye out for that. The next round of your coat or your course. And then I, you have shared so many actionable tidbits here for those of you who are listening, like I would love it. I know that Courtney would love it too. If you reach out to her and just let yeah. her know like what action tip you're taking, what, what resonated with you. Um, cause this was definitely not a lot of fluff when we got into like <laughs> what you do, you shared some straight golden nuggets. So yeah. thank you for that. Thank you for taking this time to be here. And, um, we will all be wishing if nothing else, reach out and wish her a, like happy mom vibes yeah. um, coming, <laughs> coming your way soon. Yeah. So we'll be very, thinking very about soon. you with that too. Thank you so all much. Right. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you so much for being here. We'll see you around um, Instagram and be tuning into the podcast. Thank awesome. you, lady. Sounds good. Thank you. Real quick before you go, if you got anything from today's episode, whether it be an aha around the Enneagram type or a part of their story that really resonated with you, reach out and let them know. I know as a podcast guest myself, that means the world to hear from somebody who listened to the episode, got something from it, and then took the time to follow up and let me know. I'm also going to ask you of another favor. If you haven't already, subscribe and leave a review for this podcast and when you do, because I know that you're busy as a thank you for your time and your effort to do that, I'm going to send you a type specific reference guide. Um, it's 25 to 30 pages all about your dominant Enneagram type, how it shows up and what to do with it. And then I'm also going to send you an invitation to a live training we're doing at the end of the month around your CEO style, how your type shows up in leadership and at building your business, building your marketing strategies, how to leverage your strengths, blind spots to watch out for. So that's going to be really fun. If you're listening to this after August, 2021, still email me and I'll send you the link to the replay. My email address is hello at sarahlynco.com. Again, that was hello, Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, L-Y-N-N-C-O.com. Thanks for being here and I'm looking forward to hanging out again soon. Thanks so much for being here and hanging out to the end. As a reminder, between now and the first 10 people that leave a rating and review over on Apple Podcast, you're going to get a $5 Starbucks gift card to use however you want to use. Um, all that you have to do is leave that rating and review and then take a screenshot and email it over to me at hello at Sarah Lynn Co dot com. And then we'll make sure that you get your gift card right away so that you can start using it. Thanks so much. And I will see you back here soon.